It's time to go in and start focusing a little bit more on communication in terms of trauma and how do we help people navigate that? How do we express what's possible to them? So uh, Lydia is going to come back up and take us through this next segment on difficult conversations. Please welcome back Lydia. Um, so, uh, I am here to talk a little bit about how to have these difficult conversations with patients around um, opiates, and I think this is particularly appropriate today since we started off by talking about these pretty, pretty big changes that are going to be happening to um, coverage of opiates. And so, it's one thing to know, like, okay, how do I taper an opiate? It's another thing to have sort of those, um, those skills on tapering and the skills on ensuring that people are comfortable and how do we actually then uh, treat the pain. And yet, the thing that comes up um, really frequently in terms of burnout and stress for us as providers is how do we actually have these conversations with patients in ways that are meaningful and allow us to feel like we have integrity, we're doing the right thing for the patient, and we're sort of taking care of ourselves. So that's what I want to talk to you guys about today. Um, so we're going to do some skill building around how we want to have these conversations in decreasing of opiates. Oh, and let me back up just for a second because um, you might think it's weird that a psychiatric nurse practitioner is up here talking about how to have this conversation around decreasing opiates because I don't actually decrease opiates. But I have these conversations most days of the week about benzodiazepines. And overwhelmingly, the like key tenets are the same. There's some differences with benzos because of safety, but overwhelmingly, the, the key pieces of those conversations look the same. The other thing I'll say is that this talk really draws from two, um, two brilliant thinkers. So I've stolen a lot of the content from Laura Heatseeker, who's a social worker down in Southern Oregon and Jackson County. Jackson County has been so far ahead of the curve. First, they were ahead of the curve in their opiate prescribing. They were, they were way up here in their opiate prescribing, a little bit overdoing it. And they have done an incredible job of decreasing opiates, in part because there's just been this amazing community effort. The medical director of the CCO down there has been really fabulous. And then Laura is the, the sort of primary um, behavioral, behavioralist uh, guiding that effort. And so I've stolen a lot from, um, from the way she uh, encourages people to talk about this. And then I've also taken a lot of slides from um, Brad Anderson, who's an addiction med specialist over at Kaiser. So if you really don't like my talk, you can talk to Laura and Brad about the things that are wrong with it. If you really like it, then you can thank me for kind of putting it all together. Okay, so taking their work, um, we're gonna have a conversation and really focus on building skills that are both patient-centered and center on our boundaries and our self-protection and really our, our level of burnout. So when I talk about boundaries and self-protection, I'm not talking about the medical legal aspect of this. I'm talking about the like emotional burden aspect of this um, as providers and folks that are interfacing with patients. And so in building those skills and sort of highlighting both, um, both the patient perspective and the provider, um, perspective, we're going to be talking about trauma-informed care because trauma-informed care gives us a framework that already says that both of those things are important, right? That's one of the tenets, and don't worry, we'll, def well, we'll define trauma-informed care in a second. Um, but one of the tenets of trauma-informed care is that the like emotional needs of the provider um, are also seen as important that we don't want to do burnout and that systems that create burnout for us um, ultimately become uh, poor systems for the patients as well. Okay, so in talking about trauma-informed care, let's, let's sort of define this a little bit. Trauma-informed care um, says that we use universal precautions. So instead of needing to identify which patients have experienced trauma and then targeting our interventions based on them, it says that overwhelmingly what we know is that people, especially people with chronic pain and especially people who are struggling with substance use disorders, have a history of trauma. So we just, we tailor all of our care under the assumption that people have experienced trauma. And when we tailor that care with the universal precautions, we do that by really understanding the neurophysiology of trauma. So a little bit of what I'm gonna go into today and to better have these conversations in a trauma-informed way, we'll be covering the neurophysiology. We'll do it pretty quickly, but we're gonna do that today. Trauma-informed care, so another one of the tenants, it asks that we not re-traumatize patients. So, how could the idea of re-traumatizing, how, how, how could you see these conversations around opiates re-traumatizing patients that have, have a history of trauma? Any ideas? Well, if they, see, if they see their pain as kind of an, really an inclusive of what they are, who they are, then if you're saying that the pain doesn't exist, you're possibly re-traumatizing. Yeah, one of the... You're telling them that they're not 
not something that they believe they are. Yeah, absolutely. So one of the sort of central themes of trauma often is not being seen, right? Is, is um, lack of control and then not being seen. And so if people walk into an office and they feel like their pain, which is now a part of them, is not being seen, that can be um, invalidating and re-traumatizing. So there's other ways in which we can do this. So for example, um, one of the tenets of trauma-informed care in not re-traumatizing patients is that we really understand the way that um, abusive relationships look and we try not to mimic that in the patient-provider relationship. Anyone have an idea of how the patient-provider relationship around opiates could potentially mimic an abusive, an abusive relationship, intimate partner violence? Not a control over what the provider has. Yeah. Yeah, so a patient is walking into a room where there's one person who really has all of the control in that situation, especially when it comes to these controlled substances. And so if we're not careful, we can sometimes mimic that um, control relationship that can happen in intimate uh, in partner violence. Excuse me. Yeah, absolutely. Just the stigma around people that we term drug seekers. That in itself could be re-traumatizing to experience that. Absolutely. Yeah. So knowing all of these things about neurophysiology and knowing about what abusive intimate partner violence relationships can look like, um, we change systems. So we don't just change the way that we interact with an individual client, although we, we focus, we're going to focus on that today. How do we change these communication systems with individual clients? But to do trauma-informed care, we actually try to change systems um, to, better, to better serve all people, regardless of whether they have experienced trauma or not. And then, like we talked about earlier, trauma-informed care also prioritizes um, provider well-being. So trauma-informed care says, again, that if the system doesn't, all, excuse me, if the system also re-traumatizes the provider, it's ultimately going to be traumatizing for the patient. So if we're not also watching um, provider mental health, provider burnout, et cetera, that ultimately that's going to come back to the patient and be painful. So like I said, the likelihood that people that are experiencing substance use disorders or persistent pain um, have experienced trauma is very high. We know this from the research. In fact, if you look at the ACEs study, the Adverse Childhood Experiences study, um, if you look at that study and see the connection between adverse childhood experiences or early life trauma and then addiction later in life, I mean, it, it, those numbers aren't replicated anywhere else in public health. There's nothing that is as correlative as those numbers that connect adverse childhood experiences with addiction later in life. It's pretty overwhelming when you look at it. And so what we're going to talk about then today is sort of the pathophysiology of trauma and how that includes central nervous system dysregulation. A lot of the info, info that I'm just about to dive into is going to mimic some of what Nora talked about, but we're going to look at it from a slightly different perspective. But as we move through this, I want you guys to be thinking about Lainey, so the, um, our case study for today. So Lainey has a history of intimate partner violence. She has post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, she has a traumatic brain injury. And um, she is using opiates for persistent pain. And then there's potentially some, also some addiction, right? Because she's been at the methadone maintenance clinic before. She reports that that's for pain, but it, it's not usual for someone that has only been on prescribed opiates um, to be at the methadone maintenance clinic. It can happen, but not common. So think about Lainey as we move through this. And so what I wanna guide you guys into is kind of a somatic experience of PTSD. I'm not going to try to traumatize the crowd, um, but, but I want you guys to have this sort of body feeling of, of where patients may be walking into the, um, to the office, where their body might be when they walk into the office with you. So I want you to just sit in your chair for a second and imagine that there's a cop in the rear view mirror. And just notice what happens in your body. and maybe some of the ways that your thinking changes. And this isn't a political statement about police. We could certainly go there, especially in the realm of public health, but that's not what we're going for today. I just want you guys to have the somatic experience for a second. So what are the things that you guys are experiencing? <coughs> your heart rate's going up, yep. Breathing changes. Chest feels tight. Okay. Foot on the brake. 
Okay, your foot is immediately on the brake. Did you think about that before your foot went onto the brake, or did you just do it? All right, just do it. You just did it. Okay. So your body, your body had this response well before you were like, oh, you know what? I better slow down. Your body immediately. Did oh yeah. Right. Okay. Okay. Yep. Overwhelming desire to curse. Overwhelming desire to curse. Okay. Where does that come from? Do you know what it's about? Like what, what kind of feelings it's attached to? Fear. Fear. Okay. Okay. How many of you guys, and I, I'm going to extrapolate a little bit. How many of you guys in these moments, your brain immediately goes to the worst possible outcome? Mm -hmm. So something bad happens and you are like 20,000 feet ahead of it, assuming that like the worst thing has happened, right? A couple of you guys said definitely yes, and I'm going to assume most of you have that to a little bit. So that's a thing. It's a thing that lots of people experience. It's evolutionarily there for a reason. It's called thoughts of impending doom. It's a thing. What else are you guys noticing in your body? Shaky. Shaky, so kind of tremulous. Yep, mm -hmm. absolutely. So maybe some muscle tightness connected to that. Yeah. I noticed like a heightened sense of just like children everywhere. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah. I need to do right now. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So there's a heightened sense of awareness. So your body feels a little bit more on. Yeah. And then, but what if, so, and then you feel maybe super aware of like sensory stuff. We're going back to pain, right? So you're super aware of sensory stuff. Like maybe you like are really aware that there's like a light or a noise over there, maybe. Um, but if I came up to you and I was like, what's six times six plus two? Could you do it? I mean, I couldn't do that anyways, probably. But, <laughs> but for those of you that could, could you do it in those moments? Okay, so there's a heightened sense of awareness, but your ability to do this like complex thinking or a little bit higher level thinking is usually a little bit, um, it's a little bit pushed to the side, right? Because your body, remember when Nora was talking about, I think Nora used a different word, but what I'm gonna talk about is prioritization. Your body starts to prioritize specific things to have to do with survival and it pushes other things to the side. So what are we actually talking about when we talk about these things? We're all healthcare professionals, so I, I shouldn't have to spend a whole, or I won't spend a whole lot of time, because I know you guys know it. So what are we, what do we, what do we just review? Stress response. Yeah, so this is fight or flight. This is the beginning of the stress response. Remember how many times in Nora's slides, when, she, when we were looking at that um, sort of complex diagram here, stress was that middle thing, right? That was the word right there, stress. So what we've just talked about is the fight or flight response, beginning of the stress response, <laughs> And um, we, could, we could talk for a lot about ways in which this is cultural. We could talk specifically about ways that certain communities are more targeted or experiences more than others. And yet what we know is that universally, from a physiological perspective, the same basic things happen. So we've got um, our body sort of shifts the way that we do sight, so we do blurred vision. Um, our body shifts where we're going to be doing blood flow, so we get some like nausea sometimes in our stomach or a weird feeling in our stomach, and our blood flow is going to go more to our heart. So we get increased heart rate, we get that tremulousness because we're getting more, our muscles are getting ready to go. And by the way, what, what is this all for? Like, what's it set up for from an evolutionary perspective? Safety to run, to survive from the tiger. Yeah, safety to run, to get, get away, survive from the tiger. And so what I want to focus on a little bit, just for a second, is the thinking changes. So you guys called them out already. So there's some thinking changes here. And um, how many IQ points do you think you lose under periods of, like, serious fight or flight? A lot. A lot. Okay, <laughs> just take a guess. Like, just popcorn it out. How many do you think you lose? 30. How do you know that? 30. Wow, I 30. feel like more. <laughs> yeah, because so all of us know this from an intuitive perspective that we are not quite as up here in our prefrontal cortex where we do that cognitive thinking. We know that. We know that from an intuitive perspective and sometimes we can forget it when we go into exam rooms with patients or the other thing is is we know it really well and we walk into exam rooms with patients knowing that we're not quite on board, especially when we're going to have these difficult conversations, right? Think about how patients are feeling. Okay. So just quick um, neuroanatomy lesson. So there's a stressor or threat uh, for what we're talking about. We're talking about a cop in the rearview mirror. Amygdala attaches the idea that that thing is a stressor or a threat. Um, it is the thing that has like baby memory and says, okay, that thing is something fearful. I'm gonna start to respond to it. Amygdala, by the way, pure genius. One of the smartest little places in our brain. Um, it's, it's incredibly intelligent. It's that thing that like you have a bad off feeling about someone, that's usually the amygdala. Your stomach turns in a certain t situation, that's your amygdala. But it's also, 
it's not really connected to your prefrontal cortex, so it's actually, in some ways, not that smart. So it's like a mega overgeneralizer. So I, um, I often think about my toddler, who's two and a half right now. He's like in a little amygdala, like running around on two legs. Um, so right now, he still, if things have four legs, he still is like, that thing is a dog, right? because he's an overgeneralizer. And the amygdala does this too. So the like classic story about the amygdala is you're walking down the, the sidewalk or you're walking down the street and you see a jump, uh, sorry, you see a snake and so you jump back. Because your amygdala says, oh, that is a snake, it's really scary, I'm gonna remove myself, fight or flight turns on. And then a couple seconds later, your prefrontal cortex comes on and says, dude, that's not a snake, that's a hose, you're totally fine. But your amygdala overgeneralizes and responds to things immediately without much thought, which is part of how we go to that place of thoughts of impending doom so quickly. Amygdala immediately pushes us there because it's an overgeneralizer. Amygdala sends a message down to the hypothalamus. Hypothalamus is gonna send a message down to the pituitary. Pituitary is gonna send a message down to the adrenal glands, right? That's, we should all know this one, HPA axis. Adrenal glands gonna squirt out adrenaline and catecholamines. Sorry, I'm running through this pretty quickly, but um, I, I'm happy to slow down if you want me to, but it's pretty basic neurophysiology. And in fact, I've even like kind of overly simplified this because I want you guys to, to sort of take home these key points. So um, adrenal glands squish out adrenaline catecholamines, that's our fight or flight response, but then they also squish out cortisol, right? That's our slightly longer term stress response. Comes on a little bit slower, often not felt quite as much, and then hangs out a little bit longer in our body. And so cortisol, when you really dive into the neurophysiology of trauma, it like all comes back to cortisol over and over again. I don't wanna spend a whole lot of time on this today, um, although honestly it's one of my like favorite nerdiest things to talk about. But um, what I do wanna just look at is sort of some of these basic things that cortisol does because when we start to understand the overlay of trauma and pain, it's really important. So um, one of the things we all know about cortisol doing, of course, from our um, endogenous medical mimics of cortisol is what? Did I say endogenous? I meant exogenous. What do we have that mimics cortisol in medicine? Cortisone, cortisone right? Our, our prednisone, our corticosteroids. And so what do we primarily use that for? It's an anti-inflammatory and an immune system suppressant. Right? So one of the main things that cortisol does, because again, we're prioritizing survival in these moments, so cortisol turns off the immune system for a time period because we don't need to be healing from a tiny cut or like a, a cold or a flu if we're running from a lion or tiger, right? Our body prioritizes this other thing is more important right now. So we turn off our immune system. And then what happens to anything in the body if you suppress it long enough? What happens to it? doesn't want to work anymore, or the opposite can happen because of homeostasis, it bounds back. So what we now think is sort of one of the major underlying mechanisms of the connection between chronic pain and early life adversity is actually that people are running around with low levels of cortisol, and so their endogenous anti-inflammatory mechanisms are broken, amazingly enough. So that's one of the sort of um, theses right now in this connection between um, trauma and then pain later in life is that we're running around with a bunch of folks that are sort of wired to be inflamed constantly. Okay, so cortisol does a couple other things. We'll come back to that in a second. Cortisol does a couple other things, makes you attain water, increases your blood sugar. You guys don't think there's any connection between diabetes and trauma at all, right? No, no connection. Okay. There's some muscle breakdown, increased gastric juices, and like a whole other load of things that have connection here. Um, <clears throat> but, but let's just talk for a second about what this ends up looking like, and I've already sort of highlighted it, but what are some of the things that we know physiologically are connected to early life adversity? And how they might be related to, to cortisol. It's, it's already on the board, sort of. One step of it is on the board. Depression. Yeah, absolutely. So decreased serotonin. Um, and so this one's actually far more complex than I in, have made it seem on this slide. But what, what we know is that there's an epigenetic shift in serotonin um, receptors that happens with early life adversity. For some people, it's epigenetic, so it's just for some people, that seems to sort of um, open up the doors for more incidents of depression in adulthood. Absolutely, so depression. And that, by the way, that epigenetic shift is because 
of hypercortisolemia for a time period, high cortisol levels for a time period. What did you say about that high and then the rebound of the running around with low? So yeah. If, if they experience childhood trauma or some incredibly stressful events, they'll go to surge in cortisol and then that rebound effect will create low cortisol. So what it seems like, thank you, you're, you're ahead of the game. So what it seems like is happening for these folks is that there's hypercortisolemia for a time period. This is true in early life adversity. It's also true in PTSD. There's a period of hypercortisolemia and the adrenal glands literally, because remember we're, we're talking about adrenal glands here, the adrenal glands literally get over-resourced and cortisol ultimately becomes low. Some people would call this adrenal fatigue, yeah. It's, it's actually slightly, the allopathic way of looking at PTSD is slightly different than sort of the naturopathic understanding of adrenal fatigue. The hormones are slightly different, but it's a similar concept. <laughs> yep, absolutely. Okay, so I just wanna focus on um, this one just, ever, just for a second since we touched on it earlier. We know um, that there is a huge connection between um, the immune system, diabetes, and early life trauma. So right now, lots and lots of um, research coming out with, with that connection. And I'm sure none of you guys see that in your clinical practice. No. Okay. okay, so effects of long-term hypercortisolemia. We know that people are more likely to have certain types of cancers that can be connected to childhood trauma. We know that people are more um, predisposed to blood sugar regulation problems, including um, diabetes type two and potentially diabetes one and a half as well, we think. Um, we also know that people are gonna be more likely to experience depression and suicidality. And we can see all of these things in the research. And yet what I actually, what I really wanted to get to today with the cortisol part was not so much focused on that, um, which is why we sped through it, but I really wanted to get to this main piece right here. So. <clears throat> the adrenal glands in a stressful situation squirt out adrenaline and catecholamines, and then they squirt out cortisol. And remember, going back to this idea of homeostasis, everything in the body has its own negative feedback loop to keep things in check and keep things in balance, right? And so for cortisol, there's two main places of, um, of negative feedback. There's the hypothalamus, and then what I wanna talk about today is the hippocampus. So the hippocampus, tiny place in our rear brain, actually it's not that tiny, place in our rear brain um, that is responsible for many things, including memory, um, and, and primarily what we're talking about today is, is stress, and stress is sort of balancing. So the hippocampus is responsible for the negative feedback loop for cortisol, and yet what happens, and this is sort of like what happens to the adrenal glands that we just talked about, what happens is that if cortisol levels actually go up high enough and stay up high enough long enough, the hippocampus literally starts to atrophy. So the receptors on the hippocampus say, whoa, dude, I can't handle this much cortisol. And the hippocampus literally becomes smaller. So if you do a brain scan and you compare hippocampal volume with someone with a diagnosis of PTSD, to someone without a diagnosis of PTSD, you'll see that the hippocampus is literally like squished and about half the size. And this is where things become a real bummer because the hippocampus does multiple things for us, but the thing I want you guys most to sort of hold on to today is that the hippocampus is responsible by, um, it, because it's negative feedback loop and it's in charge of sort of keeping cortisol levels down, it's responsible for calming the amygdala. So wait, what's the amygdala again? It's the overgeneralizer who decides whether something is a stressor or a threat. So when people have experienced trauma, what that means is that this entire system, this entire threat system, is shifted slightly. So it's harder to turn off, and relatively, it's on, right? We call this hypervigilance. In clinical practice, when people have PTSD, this is hypervigilance. People are consistently on. So remember when I said I wanted to take you through the somatic experience of PTSD? So now, think about that with the cop in the rearview mirror, and think about feeling like that like most of your days. And just as we move through the rest of the material, think about what it would be like to have these conversations if your body is having those experiences or if your mind is having those experiences where you immediately go to the most negative outcome or everything becomes a stressor or a threat because the amygdala is consistently on 
and yet the dampening effect is off. So think about that. OK, so a little bit of a shift here. Tell me why you guys, now that we've had this um, somatic experience of the cop in the rearview mirror, we're actually not shifting that much. Tell me what it's like for you or why you really don't like working with patients on chronic opiates or quote unquote med seekers. And just this is like a place where you can be totally honest. No judgment in this room. Okay. And, and having had that conversation with them. And, yeah. And they're not going to like it. And what, what don't you like about those conversations? Um, they get angry. Yeah. So you have to deal with angry people. Yeah, all the time. Which is stressful, creates burnout, creates clinical swirl, all those things. Yes. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay. The dynamic's not really honest. And when I was listening to the pain education talk, the, the, the goal of getting opiates Other things, mm -hmm. people are not receptive mm -hmm. to other things because that's in the way. Yep. Yep, absolutely. So you, I, I'm, I'm going to extrapolate a little bit. I don't want to steal words out of your mouth, but do you ever get the sense that like all of a sudden like I'm an opiate police person as opposed to a medical provider? Mm -hmm. it, you just can't talk about anything else. You yeah. can't get it off <laughs> that because that's, the, that's their overriding goal of the visit. Yep. Yep. Okay. Thanks. What else? Suicidal threat. <laughs> Yeah, so we're trained to take suicidality really, really seriously, right? And yet, not yet, that's the wrong word. Um, and so it becomes much more complex when someone says I'm suicidal um, if you don't give me these opiates. I'm going to be in so much pain, I'm going to become suicidal. Yep. I love how many hands go up during this section. Everyone's like, I want to talk about this. Yes. Um, I was just going to say the blame. I think that when you start the conversation, oftentimes you all of a sudden become the bad guy. Mm. Yep, yep, okay, thanks. And I saw one more hand. I think um, lately I've certainly got, I got the other day, um, it's my constitutional right to have pain medication. Mm -hmm. And it's very yep. hard to stimulate a response back that seems appropriate to that. So it's hard to formulate. Mm -hmm. And if you get the patient to kind of understand, then all of a sudden the family starts to call. Um, like, why won't you give my, my family member opiates? They're suffering. What, do you just want them to lay here and die? Mm -hmm. So it's um, those conversations that start to work. Yep, yep. Okay, you guys are hitting the nail on the head, and I really appreciate your candor and your honesty um, because, at least at my clinic, this is really some of the most challenging heart stuff that we have to deal with on a daily basis is how to have these conversations in ways that feel good. Yeah. I also just wanted to like throw out there that it, as a clinician, you feel definitely in the middle because you're getting from administration and policy that you know we need to crack down, we have to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and who, you know, very much believes that this is what's going to help their pain. And so, of course, something like pain education would be very beneficial, I believe. But you feel stuck in the middle. You know, you feel like you have to do what you're being told. And then again, you have this patient who, you know, you have a relationship with here, and you're trying to keep that relationship. So it's very yeah. conflicting as a provider. Especially, I'm glad you said that, because I think it's especially conflicting when, when, when what we've been trained to do is be patient-centered all the time. So I basically was trained that like if a patient asks you something asks you for something as long as it's not a benzo, like try it. Hey, why not, right? Like no problem with that. Um, and so then to get these this this other information saying, "Hey, no, you cannot do this." And the patient saying one thing and policy saying something else, it can feel very hard. Absolutely. So I think just for the sake of time, I'm going to move us on. Um, so we're going to come back to Laney. Um, so here is what a potential um, intake with Laney might look like in primary care. Well, hello, welcome. Uh, what do you prefer I call you? Oh, Laney's fine. Okay, okay, Laney. Um, I just go by Rachel. We're really laid back here at the Safe Space mm -hmm. Clinic. 
Um, you know, my last name's a total disaster anyway. So, any, um, this is Chloe, by oh. the way. She's my companion pet. Oh, so, oh. Yeah. She goes Wait. everywhere with me. Okay. Um, yeah. I'm not usually super into pit bulls, but um, that's um, super honor your, you know, your um, bringing what keeps you safe here. So anyway, um, I have a ton of questions I could ask you, but what's most important is what's important to you. So tell me, what brings you into Safe Space Clinic today? Um, okay, well, I, I actually, I have a head injury, so um, I have my memory doesn't work very well, so I need to, I have a list here. Oh, okay, so I'm just okay. Get, is that okay? Yeah, oh, that yes, or? thank you, thank you. That is so That's helpful. Cool. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, okay. Okay. Um, oh, wow, okay. So that's a, that's a pretty long, long list there. So we've got about 20 minutes or yeah. so. Um, well, I mean, there's, so a, maybe get, there's a lot, and I need for you to get, like, a full picture of what's happening for me. Otherwise, you're not going to really understand. And uh, so, um, okay. Yeah, okay. so I have it all right sorry, down. I'm so sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. Of course, of course. So, um, first of all, I've been in like a lot of car accidents. I've had okay. a lot of okay. oh, I'm broken just bones. On here. Okay. okay. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, I've got osteoporosis. Oh, um, okay. Have you tried? It's fossil? degenerative. Oh, um, oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. Really, I haven't heard of osteo. Okay. My bones are like crumbling. It's okay. so painful. Okay. Um, yeah. Any bones in particular? Is it <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, yeah. I mean, I've got like. I have degenerative discs in my back. Um, okay. I've got really bad neuropathy. Oh, is if that you could from see, diabetes? okay. If you could see my legs, yeah. um, they're like red and like the veins are sticking out. Is it like a circulate? Do you get cramping when you walk? Mm, with them no, then? no. Oh. Um, it's okay. like I have arthritis. Okay, let me just get your chart. Here. Okay. Um, I All have right. arthritis in my shoulder. Oh, okay. um, my physical therapist says I need to like not go to the <laughs> 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 Sorry, this is just really like. Okay, so I feel kind of overwhelmed right now, and I'm just like in a lot of pain. Yeah, so. no, I see. So tell me, um, well, what what have you tried that helps for your pain? Um, well, like, um, in the past, they at the I was on methadone for a while, and that okay. sort of was that at a methadone. It was clinic? at a methadone clinic. Oh, I did that for a really long time, okay. and then I was like, how did you get into the methadone clinic originally? It was for pain. I went for pain, so oh, it didn't feel okay. appropriate. Did you ever use any injection? No, I mean, not really. I just, I needed pain management, and so that's what they wanted me to do, so. Okay. okay. Anyway. Usually that's more for, okay. Anyway, I left that clinic because um, okay. I wanted to get off the methadone because I'm not like, I don't abuse drugs, right? So I needed something like legit for my pain. So I went to another clinic, and they gave me Oxycontin, Okay. Um, well, how and how much of that were you were you taking? I was taking um, five tabs a day. Okay. Um, um, and so another, they also. Tens or twenty. I or it's I have it in another list somewhere. I don't remember, oh. but I can give you that at some okay, point. Okay, that that would be really helpful. Any um, anyway, um, they also gave me um, Lortab too, which was oh, also on with the Oxycontin. Mm -hmm. On both of those. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> Also, I just wanted to also just let you know that um, I have like an. I, last time I was at the ED, um, they told me I have an abnormal heartbeat. Oh, so, okay. Did um, you get an EKG there? Actually, or? I didn't make it to that, but oh, okay. um, I did get a. Um, my last MRI, um, they looked at my heart and um, okay. they said it was fine, but it always feels like I'm like having a heart attack. Okay, on your MRI. Okay. Or something. Well, like, are you know. having chest pain right now? Um, yeah, I mean, my uh, I oh. always feel like my heart's racing and okay. I, mean, I feel really nervous right now okay. and it's, this is hard for me to be okay. sharing all this stuff with you. But um, So, maybe what do you do maybe that um, helps to calm you down or give you some kind of pleasure in your life? Well, I mean, I used to volunteer, um, but I can't really do that anymore oh, because okay. I can't leave my home. Um, I have a lot of anxiety. I've got agoraphobia. Oh, um, wow. Sometimes okay. I'll just be like stuck there for days. Okay. Um, do you... I feel suicidal a oh, lot. Oh, like, okay. Wow. And do you feel suicidal today? Um, well, yeah, like, okay. I feel it um, on this, all, right. all the time. So, so I have like have a lot you... of trauma and stuff. Yeah. So. Have you met Lydia? Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, um, behavioral health 
Oh providers? no no I've got a I've got a counselor and I've had a psychiatrist so and I, they prescribe me yeah. um, lorazepam and klonopin and so oh, I sat there so I didn't <laughs> see like I don't need to talk to another person about it that okay. seems okay. to be like kind of ridiculous so yeah I know I hear that you've got um, some other supports there but here at our clinic we really work as a team to try to understand how all different parts of our experience affect our pain. So why don't I, you just sit tight for a sec. I'm just gonna pop out and get Lydia. She's gonna be super helpful to us here. So just sit tight. Oh, hey! <laughs> 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 Hello, guys. Okay, that's how MI's not done. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. I don't met that patient. <laughs> yeah, so just to clarify, uh, this was certainly not meant at all to poke fun of people that have a history of trauma. It was really meant to poke fun at a system that thinks that we can treat people that are these really complex, dynamic individuals in 20-minute office visits, especially when they have um, complex chronic pain. And so what we're trying to highlight there is the experience that you all may be having when you're having these difficult conversations with people. And what I want to do now is flip it around a little bit and talk about what Lainey's experience is. So this is from Laura Heatsecker. She's the social worker that I talked about um, that is from Southern Oregon. Um, and so what they did is they did a patient questionnaire. They, they tried to really understand what patients' experiences were like. So here's some of the things um, that patients said they experienced in these conversations with providers. They said that they were made to feel like they did something wrong. Remember trauma-informed care? We don't want to re-traumatize people. So folks said they were made to feel like they did something wrong. They were made to feel like a criminal or a drug addict. And this one always is so like poignant to me because we created this. I mean, maybe no one in this room, but like the opiate epidemic is something that the medical world created. And then people come in and they're like, this thing works. I would like my refill. And we're like, oh, no, 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 no. I'm in it. Nope. I need to check the database. I need to do this. I need to do that. I mean, not for everyone, right? I'm, I'm overly simplifying here. But if we really think about sort of if we step back and zoom out a little bit about what's happened, we created this mess. Um, it, I think in particular the pharmaceutical companies did, and then we're like, oh no, no, you can't ask me for that stuff, right? And we treat people like they're doing something wrong. They said that they felt like they were being punished, they felt like they were being talked down to. They didn't understand why they were being forced to make these changes. And then this one I think is, is kind of a take home one. They felt like we didn't have concern for their pain, only our policy. So how many of you guys have had these conversations with people and focused on the policy? I certainly have. Benzos? Oh yeah, we don't do that at this clinic. That's our policy. That's how I used to have these conversations pretty often. <clears throat> so kind of going off of what we know the patient's experience might be, and then I would say overlay these, if you can, just for a second, overlay some of these experiences with that feeling of there being a cop in the rearview mirror. Just kind of think about what that would be like. And so when we move into skill building, carry all of that with you. So what we want to do, um, and, and this is going to sound like things you've heard, but I, I, I want to sort of um, shake it up a little bit. We're going to actively and explicitly involve your patients in decisions that affect their health care. Treat them as valued partners and part of their care team. So what could you do slightly differently, maybe in talking about the opiate epidemic that you haven't been doing, if you really started to think about folks as active participants and involved them and didn't speak down to them? What are some, some examples of things you could do? Ask them what's worked in the past. Okay, so what's worked in the past, sure. Well, even just using the language, like let's work on a plan together mm -hmm. to yep. address the issue. Yep. And how many of you guys do education around the opiate epidemic with your patients? How many of you guys actually talk about what that has looked like historically? Um, That's great. I say is that I admit that we screwed up. Yes, thank you. I tell people that yes. we have put people in danger. I have killed patients um, and say, now I don't want to do that anymore. We're sorry it's changed. And that's why we're having a conversation. And I think there's enough out in the media that some people have heard it. 
Yeah, yeah, I think you're right. And so this is one of the main things that I would say if you're going to try to transform this conversation and make people an active participant, tell them the stuff that you kind of consider to be a little bit behind the scenes, the opiate epidemic stuff. Tell them that that's part of the context of the care that they're receiving right now. Hey, 10 years ago, we used to give this stuff out like candy. Here's what the research says and here's how dangerous that is. Here's why we're having this conversation today as opposed to well, yeah, I, you know, you called for too many early refills. I, I, I'm going to start taking you off, or whatever it is, right? So, really, if you want to actively include someone as partner, tell them the context of this conversation. Emphasize your concern for the patient's safety. So, if there's one sort of takeaway from today, it is not to fall back on the "that's our policy" conversation. It is to fall back on the thing that is the reality fallback thing, which is safety, right? We're not taking people's pain meds away because we are, because we want to punish them. We're not, the main reason we're doing it is because of patient safety, right? And so if you need something to come back to in a conversation, consistently come back to that well, thing. Well, I also think actually even better than that is what we know the research is showing that there's other tools in the bag of tricks and to also, you know, give them hope that there's, that, you know that they can do it a different way even though it's been done this way in the past yep so, so validating we'll get there we'll absolutely get there yeah so emphasize concern for the safety and don't worry we're gonna get to lots more stuff you're like dude I've heard this before there's more coming um, so reiterate your primary objective support them help them safely and effectively manage their pain and then like we talked about before do provide context that allows um, everyone to understand what is happening that allows a little bit more transparency which is something that we generally highlight in trauma-informed care so the backdrop of this conversation, this sort of introductory conversation, things that you want to do to lessen central nervous system stimulation, right? Because this is all the stuff we're talking about with trauma and pain has to do with central nervous system and heightened CNS activity. So what can you do to decrease the central nervous system stimulation? So some of the things that you might want to do, can you control the lighting? So at my office at the clinic, and this was not my idea, this was Susan Marie's idea, who's in the back today, but my office at the clinic has very dim lighting. And I see people all the time come from the waiting room, which is a bustle of activity, it's brightly lit, there's the lights up above, they come into the office and there's this immediate deep breath, which tells me that their nervous system is shifting just ever so slightly for that conversation that we're about to have. So if you can control the lighting, that's fabulous. Can you control the seating arrangement? So. Um, what are, what are some ideas to make that seating arrangement more trauma-informed and to lessen that central nervous system sort of reactivity? How do you do that? Side by side. Side by side, yep. So it feels really different if I come up to you and I'm like, we're not gonna have any more refills of that than if I'm sitting next to you or perpendicular and I say, let's have this conversation. So there can be an aggressive stance of the body, which is face to face, and you can shift that by changing where you sit in the room. Transparency, the backdrop to this conversation, so controlled substance agreements and contracts, making sure that everyone knows. Again, transparency is sort of a core tenet of trauma-informed care. Making sure that everyone knows what the expectations are going into this treatment plan. So if you're gonna be prescribing opiates, everyone should have a copy of what is being expected from both parties. And then make decisions before you go into the exam room. This is kind of a key piece here. So make the decision based on the clinical data that you have. Do not make the decision when you're sitting with the patient. Why? Because when you're sitting with the patient, that amygdala, remember Rachel, so that video was of Rachel, who's our chief medical officer at Central City Concern. So what was happening to her amygdala? Her amygdala is freaking out. So is she gonna be able to make like clear, coherent decisions in that exam room? that are based on the medical evidence of what works versus what doesn't work and is dangerous. So make those decisions before you go into the exam room because medicine's all about heart. I really truly believe that, that like so much of what we do is about relationships and about connecting, but you do not want just relationships and connection to be guiding your prescription pad, not this day and age in the context of the opiate <coughs> epidemic. So <clears throat> some more skills on how we do this. So you brought up this validation piece. So. <laughs> Um, I, I want to just highlight a couple things here. The validation piece is an incredibly important, um, uh, it's incredibly important, um, and I've watched again Susan Marie do this for years. So say again what you said earlier. Uh, what did I say? Uh, uh, oh, that not focusing on the safety piece, but focusing on the tools and the bag of tricks 
that could be that evidence shows that it could be really helpful. Yeah, and and it works for the other thing that I do is actually I have patients over the years that I've worked with that got off narcotics and things and and how the difference of their life, their quality of life, is better, mm -hmm. and how you know with the, and having the support and the tools. So. Yeah, so, okay, so there's two pieces, thank you for that. There's two pieces to validation that I wanna highlight. So the first is really trying to see and hear the patient and their pain and their experience. So not sort of thinking to yourself, oh, this is psychosomatic, oh, it's not a big deal, but really seeing them and then validating how much pain they're in and how scary this can be. Especially when we're taking away, when we're talking, we're having conversations about taking away something that they feel has worked. And I would argue that the research says it doesn't work for pain management, but most likely it re opiates really, really help for emotional regulation. Now, I hope you don't hear me say that they're appropriate for emotional regulation or that they're safe for emotional regulation, but they sure do make things feel better. Imagine what an oxycodone would feel like if you had been running around with a cop in the rearview mirror for the past two weeks probably pretty dang good, right? So someone's about to come into this conversation and say, hey, we're not gonna do that anymore. So validate how hard and how scary that conversation must be. Lead with that validation piece. This is really scary. And then the second piece that you wanna do around validation is validate and reassure that you can do better. And it, they're not always gonna hear this, but it's a useful place for the conversation to start. So what we know, the research says, is that these don't help we have safer alternatives, and that I've seen people do better. And at this point in my career, I can certainly say I have seen people do better. I've seen people that have gotten off of benzodiazepines and opiates. I have one patient in particular where she's very committed to those medications. In fact, anything that was a central nervous system suppressant, she loved it. And anytime we took one away, she wanted a different one. So if we decreased her benzo, she wanted me to go up on her clonidine. If we decreased her clonidine, she wanted me to go up on her gabapentin, right? So I've, and I've seen patients, I've seen this patient over the last couple years, now off opiates, uh, actually she's on, Subo on Suboxone, and she's off benzos, and she's far more functional and in far less pain than she's ever been, and she's able to experience things, like she's able to experience her life. And so I can tell people with much certainty we can do better, and you deserve better, and you deserve more safe care. So then let's go to the education piece, because um, remember, let's go back to that piece where patients felt like they were being talked down to. So how do we do education that doesn't feel like patients are being talked down to? So I'm stealing this from motivational interviewing. It's super simple, basic motivational interviewing technique. Elicit, provide, elicit. So when you do this, this is a way to provide education that doesn't allow people or doesn't usually allow people to have that experience of condensation where they're being condescended to. So you start with, would it be okay if I told you about? So in the context of this conversation, you might say, I understand that this is really scary. Would it be okay if I told you about what is happening sort of on a national level with opiate type medications and what we now know about those medications? So you start with a question, then you provide the education, and research sto shows is a great sort of sticking with the medicine way to start that sentence. So research shows such and such. And then you can follow with, I have seen in my personal practice, because, he, because people often come back with like, but I'm not the research, right? How many, got, how many of you heard this? I'm not the research, I'm an individual person, and this is what works for me. So you can follow, research shows, and I have seen people do better off of these medications very validating, very reassuring, shows them that you know that they're both an individual and that you're grounded in the medical literature. So you know what you're doing. Yeah. So in that place, people are convinced that it works for them. Yeah. The people I'm talking about, the research that I'm talking about doesn't apply to them. So we'll get to those folks in a second. So we're still having our introductory, conver here's how to have this introductory difficult conversation. And we will get to the folks that um, that really caused the central nervous system uh, flare-ups for us in a second. So provide the education, research shows, I know, then you elicit feedback. So, so that research I just told you about or those patients I just shared a little bit about, how do you think that that could look for your life? So that means that you're ensuring that they have heard what you said and that they're starting to integrate it into their personal narrative and their personal understanding of themselves. So you wanna give them a second to do that because far too often, especially in medical visits, we've got 15 to 20 minutes, we're going super fast, we're just trying to check off the boxes. 
we go through this education, we're like, oh, dude, I, I told them about that. We, I did patient education, that was awesome. But if we don't actually give them a, just a moment in that office visit to integrate the information into their personal narrative of self, it hasn't really gone anywhere. And it may just be like, well, they just told me about research and I already know these medications work for me. So we did validation, so you start, let's just go back for a second. So validation, so you validate that their experience is real, that you see them, you hear them as an individual. Validate that you think that you can do better, so provide some assurance, you think you can do better. And then do education via elicit, provide, elicit. <clears throat> and if this fails, so now we're getting to the part that you're talking about. If this fails, if you're dealing with addiction, this is a, um, a slide from Brad Anderson. Um, and so I think at this point we should really be calling this a substance use disorder, right? We really are trying to shift this language from a, from a word we think is relatively stigmatizing of addiction. We wanna shift that to substance use disorder. So if you're in the realm of substance use disorder, how do you have these conversations? So again, I wanna start with some sort of basics on this before we dive into a little bit more of the details. <coughs> Stay in the medical expert role. And again, I think the easy, one of the easier ways to do that is to make decisions before you go into that exam room. Medicine is all about heart, nursing is all about heart, and yet in these moments, we wanna stay in the medical expert role. We wanna emphasize concern for their condition and safety. Speak to what is behind the patient's comment, not the comment itself. And this one can sometimes get a little bit confusing for people. For anyone that is a behavioral health provider in the room, this is something you know pretty well. At least I feel like I have a lot of experience doing this in the realm of psychosis. So if a patient comes to you and says, there are people following me, um, Trump is following me, and, um, and no one's leaving me, da da da, you never say, Trump's, <laughs> dude, Trump's not following you. You don't say that, right, because it breaks the relationship, it breaks the therapeutic bond, it's super invalidating to the patient. But what you do do is you go around the specifics of that psychosis and then you meet the fear. So when a patient says like, maybe they make a threat or they make a, a sort of a general statement around their opiates, what you wanna do is what's the fear behind that? What's, where's the anxiety? What's happening? So step around the specifics and come back to the, what you think is the emotion that they might be experiencing, which is most likely fear. And we'll get to some examples of that in a second. And then again, speak to what you know to be true and trust your science. And this one's hard because science has lied to us, right? Like 10 years ago, science said, hey, give all the opiates you want. I remember in nursing school really being encouraged by my nursing, um, my nursing faculty to give people lots of opiates in the hospital because the idea that opiates were addictive, um, what I was taught, that the idea that opiates were addictive or that were gonna create substance use disorders was false and that we really needed to treat people's pain. We now know it's, it's far more complex than that. You don't just give someone an opiate and they're addicted. That's not how it works. Um, there's more things happening. But so it's hard, I think, sometimes to come back and trust your science. And so if you need to stay grounded, you can say the science or you, you can think to yourself what I know to be true today what the research says today, because we know that sometimes this can get tricky and it can lie to us. So stick to what you know to be true today. So let's talk about how this would actually look or some things you might hear in clinical practice. And I'll take some, um, hopefully I'll take some volunteers from the audience. Anyone wanna read that very first circular bullet point? Are you accusing me of being an addict? I have never accused anyone of diabetes, but I've diagnosed them with it, and that is what I am trying to do now, to diagnose. So there's a couple of things here. If we go back here, what has happened in this response, and again, this is from Brad Anderson, what the response is really stays in the medical expert role. It doesn't sort of rev up. It stays in the medical expert role. It's very non-stigmatizing, right? It says like, well, you're really struggling with addiction. We need to do this and this. It says, I have diagnosed a substance use disorder before, or that's what I would probably do with it now. And then it also goes around this thing, right? The patient is, is, um, is, is trying to sort of, in this particular instance, the patient is trying to sort of um, move things up. They're probably at this point trying to encourage response in your own central nervous system, right? A statement like, are you accusing me of being an addict? It brings up the energy of the whole room. And so you can kind of step around that energy and say, I'm not trying to accuse you. I am doing this thing that medical providers do, which is to make diagnoses, boom. Um, I, think it, I think that one is particularly trauma-informed um, because it really, um, it, it's, 
it could be read as traumatizing, but it really remains so neutral in that moment um, that I, I think it, it keeps us uh, in a safe place. Don't label me as a druggie. Anyone want to read the potential response to that? I have no interest in labels at all. I'm interested in helping people who are struggling with medical problems such as an addiction. Yep. So again, see how it really stays in that medical expert role, really decreases any kind of tension that could be building and kind of goes around the statement and addresses the, the sort of end goal there. Anyone want to read this point? So you're basically saying that I'm a junkie? I'm saying that addiction is a medical problem that responds to treatment, not a problem of bad morals or behavior. Do you want me to lose my job? Do you want me to be on the street? Anyone want to read the response to that? So what Brad Anderson says, and which I really love, is I want you to have safe and effective pain control, and it is in my medical opinion that your current medicine won't give you that. And I love this. I just love the language of in my medical opinion, because that's what you're giving. And often these conversations, um, I think on both sides, remember we've really focused on like the experience of both the provider and the patient today. I think on both sides, it, we can forget that what is happening here is a medical office visit. It can feel much more charged than that. So this just brings everyone back down to, hey, and it's pretty validating. And it validates assurance. In my medical opinion that your current medicine won't give you that, and then you have the opportunity to say, and I think we can do better. <clears throat> So this one, the patient says, do you have pain? And I love this response here. I want to take every minute of our time today to talk about your pain management plan. Deflex, calms things down a little bit, and then also re-centers your care and concern for the patient. Says what we're actually talking about today is you and your care management plan. I wish that you could feel my pain. And then the validating response is, I know that you're suffering, and I'm sure that we can work together to reduce pain so that you don't have to suffer. Somewhat cheesy, but I think useful. And so if they threaten you, someone mentioned the, the Constitution. Was that you? What did it like? Um, I have never had anyone say that to me before. And it, it certainly seems like the political climate where that's the kinds of things we might be hearing more of. Um, <clears throat> okay, so I heard it's illegal for you to let me to go into withdrawal, or in your case, it's against the Constitution. It's really, huh, okay. Um, withdrawal isn't uncomfortable, but not life-threatening. I can prescribe you medicines to help with withdrawal symptoms. And so this is a perfect example of going around. So the patient is charging you with doing something that is illegal, which increases the central nervous system responsiveness of everyone in the room. And yet right here, you move around that and you address the fear which is, I'm going to be in withdrawal, and withdrawal really sucks. So you move around that threat, and you address the fear. Withdrawal is uncomfortable, but it's not life-threatening. I can prescribe you medicines to help with the withdrawal symptoms. Of course, this is not that particular verbiage you can't use with benzodiazepines, um, because of course, withdrawal can be life-threatening if it's done too quickly. Um, but I, I think a similar, in a similar vein, you can use that with benzodiazepines. I'll just go and use heroin. I certainly hope that you don't because you know that I don't think any type of opiate will help your pain. Which again, moves around this sort of threatening, amping up um, experience that could be happening in the room, really stays grounded in the medical experience, and then also offers you another place to validate, which is like, I know you're in pain, and I don't think any opiate is gonna help at this point, regardless of what kind you use. It also uh, detaches you from the outcome here except that you want to provide good medical care and that you're concerned about their, their safety. It detaches you like, oh, I really don't want you to start using those. That's not what it, you know, you don't get kind of caught into that conversation. <clears throat> don't bother with any other meds. I'll just kill myself. Um, so this is, this is the one where I just call the suicide clinician of the day at my clinic when this is happening. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> so uh, what you want to do in that case is, of course, take the suicide threat very seriously and for yourself, know that those suicide threats, you can decrease your own CNS reactivity by saying, when these threats are connected to controlled substances, 
there's not as much threat. It doesn't mean that they're not a threat, but you can take that and there's a little bit of safety and then address it like you would any other patient that says that they're suicidal. And in that, when you're responding to someone that says they're suicidal, stay in the medical expert role and do what the research says best when we're dealing with folks that are suicidal. I'm getting a lawyer, I'm calling KGW, um, so they're amping it up, right, amping it up. You do what you feel is right, of course. Look, at, Listen how like disconnected from the outcome that is and how neutral that remains. Oh, it's a news, it's like a news, yeah, so they're, they're threatening to call lawyer or the news, basically. You do what you feel is right, of course, and that's what I'm gonna do for you too. I'm gonna prescribe you medications that I, or prescribe you a treatment plan, whatever it is that I think is appropriate for the pain. Boom, very grounded in medical, grounded in the science, um, and still relays concern for the patient, despite the fact that they are now telling you that they're gonna call a lawyer on you. You're still conveying that you have concern for them and that you are concerned with their safety. You have a family, don't you, doc? So that one, sometimes I get questions from people. They're like, well, pa you know, patients ask me about my family. And, and that's fine when patients ask about family. The, um, what uh, Dr. Anderson is getting at in this final bullet point is if they start to threaten you. If they move to the realm of threatening behavior, that's when it's appropriate to involve 911. Call the cops. So some sort of wrap up juicy points here. Boundaries really in this realm make everyone safer. I think oftentimes people think trauma-informed care is just like being nicer to everyone. And I would really sort of counter that and say trauma-informed care actually means we have incredibly deep, loving, warm, strict boundaries. Very strict boundaries. So in that, it's sort of in the realm of the boundaries, how do you just have boundaries in office visits when these conversations are going in circles, when they're not getting anywhere? And so when you've gotten to the point where all of the things that we have gone over today aren't working, um, and this one I have started to use like religiously since hearing um, Dr. Anderson give this talk, and it's just so brilliant and it works so well. Opiates, benzos, whatever it is, opiates are off the table. How would you like to spend the rest of our office visit today? really shifts the tone in the room. And do you do that after you've kind of gone into history to show that you've listened and decided? Absolutely, yeah, this is like, this is way down in this conversation. Yep, this is way down in the conversation. Hopefully this is not your first visit. I could see potentially sometimes it's appropriate in the first visit, but hopefully this is like, you kind of know the patient, you guys have hopefully talked about a treatment plan and the, the sort of perseveration on opiates has continued. And then you get to say, I'm still concerned about you, right? What else do you want to talk about in the visit today? The meta communication there is I still want to provide care to you. And says the boundary is clear here. There is no more conversation about this. So let's focus on your care otherwise. Yeah. It's good that how, how would you like to spend our office visit today instead of saying, how else can I help you? Exactly, yeah. And you are saying you can help me. Right. Right, how would you, yeah, it doesn't give them an opportunity to say you can't help me anymore. So um, that open-ended question really, and it also throws the power back to them, right? You have just really, and, and I think for everyone's safety, you've created a boundary which can feel like you're taking some power away, but you're giving some power right back. And so the meta communication is, I'm still here to help you, I still wanna provide services to you. That part is off the table, but what else? What else can we talk about today? There is nothing that you can do or say to make me prescribe you opiates, increase your dose, give you an early refill. Just another way to have that, that strong, warm boundary. There is nothing else that you can do or say that is gonna change my prescribing practice today. How else would you like to spend our office visit? When, how often, when you say things like that, did say I have nothing else to say to walk out? Sometimes, okay. sometimes. I mean, it, it's, not, it's not golden. None of this stuff is golden. I, I just think that really underlines the, the critical importance of number one, our being willing to be vulnerable and hearing the pain. Yeah. We need to know that we yeah. really get it, what it's yeah. like to feel the pain. Got to validate you know, we it first. We have all this knowledge about this isn't mm -hmm. really tissue damage and all this kind of stuff. Yeah. That's not going to go anywhere until they know that we get it, what yeah. it's like and how scary it is. Yeah. So I often talk about having people describe to me their individual fingerprint of anxiety, for example. Mm -hmm. 
So I want to know the individual fingerprint of pain. What's that really like? And make yourself sit and listen for a few minutes about what that really feels like. Because until they know you get it, none of this is going to go anywhere. Once they know you get it and that there's hope for making it better, then you can build on that with all these things. Yep. What do you mean by here? By fingerprint, I mean, you know, we each have an individual fingerprint, literally. And so when people say the word depression or anxiety, I always want to know, well, that's fine, but what's your fingerprint in anxiety? What does that feel like for you in everyday life? When you wake up in the morning, when you go to work, or when you're at the grocery store, what's that like for you inside, in your brain, in your body? Tell me more about it. Tell me, give me examples. Describe the worst case. You really got to let them and so I think, Susan, what you're putting on is that validation piece comes before all the rest of it. Absolutely. That is the, the cornerstone. And these pieces, these boundary pieces, this is when you have exhausted all of the other tools in your toolbox. Susan, you had a... I was just going to add to what Susan was saying is that that's true. Everybody, especially the people with chronic pain, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Okay, so for the sake of time, I'm going to wrap us up, but if you guys could just popcorn out like one or two things that you got um, from this talk, like the most important things you got from this talk. What were they? I did structure. Structure, okay. Talking points. Talking points? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's huge. That's huge. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Good. And so some of the things that I really want you guys to um, come away with are this focus on safety, um, focus on the concern, and really validating their experience. Um, coming back to this, this is what the medicine says, um, and then doing this and building systems in a way that is trauma informed.